Hi, it's Maddie with The Innocence Topic, and today we're going to be talking about our story, Simon. Before we get to him, though, we have to talk about Anthony Porter. Anthony Porter was a man who served 17 years on death row for a murder of two teenagers who were engaged to be married and shot to death near a swimming pool in Southside Chicago. Their names were Marilyn Green and Jerry Hillard. William Taylor was among the six witnesses who said they saw Porter either running after the gunfire or actually pulling the trigger. Taylor is mentioned in specific here because his recollection of what he witnessed actually changed over time. This isn't special to him as a witness, but mentioned to show the unreliability of these witness identifications. And despite leads towards other suspects, Porter seemed to be the only lead or suspect pursued. Porter heard that he was under suspicion, so he went to the police to turn himself in where he was immediately arrested and charged with murder, among other comparatively small crimes. After a short trial, Porter was sentenced to death by a judge who, during sentencing, called Anthony Porter a perverse shark. Anthony spent all of his time behind bars trying to appeal his sentence. He appealed all the way to the Supreme Court but was denied at every turn. The last day of execution he got was in 1998 when his mental capacity was tested and his IQ was placed at 51. His attorneys were able to argue he didn't understand stand his punishment by death, not just that he didn't, but that he was incapable. 48 hours before he was meant to be killed by the state, his stay went through. Talk about saved by the bell. At this time, journalism students at Northwestern University investigated this case as a part of the Metal Innocence Project. During this investigation, they uncovered numerous flaws in the prosecution. William Taylor, when speaking to a private investigator, recanted his account of events saying the police threatened, harassed, and intimidated him in order to incriminate Porter although the private investigators did not speak to any of the other original six witnesses. The same year, in 1998, our story Simon's estranged wife came forward to testify against him. Inez Jackson claimed she was with Simon when he shot the teenagers while skimming money from drug deals. Her nephew corroborated her story, saying he, or they, fled to his apartment following the murders. Simon was soon contacted by private investigators and the Innocence Project. Four days following that, Simon went to the police station and confessed while being videotaped. In September of 1999, Simon pled guilty to two counts of murder and was sentenced to over 37 years in prison. 2005, Inez Jackson and Walter Jackson recanted their statements. Jackson was on her deathbed and said the professor, leading the students in investigation, David Protus, had given Inez Jackson money for the statement, money she desperately needed to free her son from an unrelated crime. Soon after, Simon recanted his confession, saying that the private detective and another man pressured him into making a false statement by showing him a video of a supposed actor who said they witnessed Simon kill the young teens. They threatened and intimidated him, they posed as city police officers and promised him a light sentence and even a movie deal if he just confessed. Both the professor and private detective denied any wrongdoing, saying his claims are false and they believed he was guilty. Northwestern put him on an administrative leave. Protus resigned from the university in the coming years and actually became the head of the Chicago Innocence Project. The state attorney conducted an investigation into Simon's conviction over the course of a year, which concluded with Simon's charges and sentence being vacated. Anita Alvarez, after the investigation ended, stated the investigation by the Metal Innocence Project involved a series of alarming tactics that were not only coercive and absolutely unacceptable by law enforcement standards, they were potentially in violation of Mr. Simon's constitutionally protected rights. So in 2014, Simon was free. From the crime, he had absolutely no involvement in. After serving 15 years and discovering documents associated with Porter's attempt at suing the city, where the city argued against a settlement saying Porter was guilty and the jury agreed with them, resulting in Porter getting no settlement. Our story, Simon, sued Northwestern University Innocence Project in claim that he was deceived and coerced into falsely confessing. In November of 2018, an undisclosed settlement was reached. We can only imagine how much the settlement was based on how much he was asking for, which was $40 million. The conclusion of this is interesting, though, because the Northwestern University Innocence Project had helped exonerate so many people on death row. Illinois, more specifically the city of Chicago, put a moratorium or end on executions in place to this day. As a result of the state, city, and their systems that sent so many people to death row that the Innocence Project was able to send free. 
What's important about this, though, is that it shows the faults in our justice system that exist in any system or organization meant to address those faults. People who took on positions where they were supposed to work to free the innocent conspired to do so by imprisoning another innocent person in their place. Which makes me think of the Stephen Avery case, which I brought up in my last episode, where he alleged that the state had conspired against him, which of course is a whole other kind of fall game. Both the alleged conspiracy and the proven conspiracy are outlandish in very different ways. It almost seems like Avery's alleged conspiracy against him had more merit to it because the state has more backing towards this kind of conspiracy than just two guys who aren't even involved in the justice system trying to send a man to jail. They cost their organization and university millions of dollars with what seems like a goal of notoriety. They, or he, more specifically, Mr. Protus, will never be Barry Sheck or Peter Newfield. This is also not a representation of the Innocence Project at large. The founders spent years learning DNA science that irrefutably proves innocence. I'd bet the money Protus lost Northwestern University, they would never show up to a suspect's home and pretend to be police officers. They would never risk incarcerating the wrong person, which is why they so heavily focus on DNA evidence or new evidence at large. They need something tangible, not just a new test testimony decades after the crime. And while the Innocence Project will offer to cover costs associated with investigation, DNA, or exoneration, they never, or should never, offer outright cash. It's blatant bribery. The worst part of all of this, though, is that Marilyn Green and Jerry Hiller's murders remain unsolved despite being supposedly solved twice. Porter may have been a victim, Simon definitely was, but Green, Hillard, and their families have been perpetually stuck in a cycle of being solved, unsolved, and forgotten, which none of them deserve. At the end of this, it's important to note a couple things. The Innocence Project works to exonerate the innocent, but they can only do so much when there's certain parts of the Innocence Project network who work towards the notoriety that Barry Sheck and Peter Newfield rightfully gained from exonerating the innocent. It's almost like some people would do anything to be in their shoes, even if they're doing it the wrong way.